Good morning. Time for our midweek Bible study. We're back into the book of Exodus again, of course. Uh, Going to finish up the very end of chapter 5 and move into chapter 6. And before I start, let me just say that with today being the day before Thanksgiving, I think today's lesson is very timely. Um, thankfulness can be really challenging for us when circumstances are rough. And, and I get that. I, I'm the same way. Uh, when circumstances don't go my way, I admit, I confess, the, the first thing that pops into my mind is not, oh, thank you, Lord. Um, that is not how that works with me anyway. And maybe it is with you, and that's fine. Uh, I hope it is. Uh, I have to work at it. Um, and what we're going to see today is something along those lines. And, and it's really difficult for us, I think, to process at times when the things that happen to us happen in spite of the fact that we're actually doing what we believe God's called us to do. In other words, the question is, is it possible that God would allow a calamity to come upon someone who's obeying him? See, we like to think that, just like the friends of Job thought, bad things only happen when we sin. And as long as we keep ourselves clean and we keep ourselves moving in the direction that God wants us to go and we're doing the things that God wants us to do, well, then nothing bad should happen. Is that the case? We're going to see this morning. We'll start here at Exodus, Exodus chapter 5, verses 22, 23, down through uh, chapter 6, verse 8 is where we're going to be going. So let me read that this morning. We'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. <clears throat> then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians." and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Father, we, we pause, as always, Lord, uh, before we dive into this, help us, Father, we ask, may your spirit uh, speak into our lives, even as these words are spoken, that your word would penetrate and would mold and shape our hearts the way you want it molded and shaped. And that, Father, we would come to a realization of who you are and what that means for us today. We thank you, Father, for the time we have here now and ask, Lord, that you use this time to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here we see something interesting. <clears throat> Moses, of course, has been confronted by the foreman of the Hebrews. Remember, they had run to Pharaoh after they had been beaten for failing to meet their quota of bricks. And Pharaoh had turned them aside and said, you just need to get back to work. You're obviously way too idle. You have way too much free time on your hands. So go get your own straw and go make your bricks just like before. <clears throat> and they found Moses and Aaron waiting for them when they came out from Pharaoh. And the Hebrew foreman complained to Moses saying, this is your fault. You went before Pharaoh and now look at what predicament we find ourselves in. And Moses immediately turned to the Lord and said, oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil 
to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Now, it's somewhat crazy to me that anyone would kind of question Almighty God. Although, to be perfectly honest, I have done so on more than one occasion myself. And you probably have also. Moses and Aaron have been accused by the Hebrew foreman of bringing calamity upon the people of Israel. Pharaoh had imposed punishment in the form of denying straw to make bricks, but yet not lowering their quota that they had to provide. The Hebrew foreman had been beaten for their failure to meet this quota. And now Moses lays the blame squarely upon the Lord. He even goes so far as to declare that what the Lord has done is evil. And here's the reality that we have to come to grips with. Even when we do exactly what we believe God has called us to do, the outcome can be a disaster. The train can go off the rails. You know, how many times have we heard the story of missionaries going on the field, taking their children with them, and while on the field, one of their children comes down with a life-threatening illness that either requires them to return back home or, in some cases, even takes the life of the child. But yet the missionaries were doing exactly what God called them to do. How many times have you perhaps tried to share the gospel with somebody that you had made an acquaintance with and they refused to listen to you and you could tell that the relationship was now off the rails? This was not going to become a close friendship. And it makes us wonder, did I do the right thing? And the second thing it usually makes us wonder is, does God really care about me? Does he care what happens to me? Moses essentially accuses God of not caring for Israel. Ever since you sent me to Pharaoh, God, he's done nothing but evil to us, and you have not delivered your people at all. He accuses God of having evil intent in sending him to Pharaoh. Because Moses was, after all, at the center of God's will at this time. He was saying and doing everything that God had told him to say and do. And the outcome was horrendous. Pharaoh has shown nothing but contempt for God and for his people. Moses himself has been perceived now as an enemy of the people of Israel, at least as far as the Hebrew foremen are concerned. The only good thing that we can see about verses 22 and 23, in fact, is... At least Moses turned to God first. Unlike the foreman of the Hebrew slaves who ran to Pharaoh, Moses has turned to God. And while the accusation against God is pretty harsh and way off base, at least that's where he went. And I think we see in God's response to Moses the steadfast love and patience of God Almighty. Verse 1 of Exodus 6. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he, he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. There's one thing that we should always keep in mind, especially when it seems like things are going off the rails. God is always in control. Regardless of how things might appear. Remember the Moses, that, that Moses had already been told by God that Pharaoh would only relent and release the people of Israel because a strong hand moved against him. And God intended to show his strong hand. God doesn't try to justify himself to Moses, which is powerful in, its, in itself. Because God has no reason to justify his actions to us. God has things in exactly the right position that he desires. We can debate all we want about free will. And obviously, as a free will Baptist, I am a big proponent of man's free will. We have free will. We are free moral creatures that God has sovereignly created and granted to us the privilege of being able to make free moral choices. 
No one forces us to choose. But even in our free will, God's sovereignty still reigns. And that's what God is reminding Moses of here. He says, remember, you're going to see what I'm going to do to Pharaoh. I told you once, it was only by a strong hand that Pharaoh would relent. God continues in verses 2 through 5. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, El Shaddai. But by my name, the Lord, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. So this is what God says, remember Moses, don't forget, I am Yodhedvedeh, I am Yahweh, I am he who is, I am who I am. I appeared to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty. But by my name, I am who I am. I did not make myself known to them. Now, let's understand something. God will always remember his promises, and that's what he's telling Moses. I, will, I have remembered my covenant. I haven't forgotten the people of Israel and the promises I've made to them through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But understand something, Moses. The way Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew me is not the way that you know me. He says, they knew me as El Shaddai, God Almighty. You know me as I am who I am. Now, it doesn't mean that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not know the name Yahweh, Yodhed Vitae. But God didn't reveal that full side of himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as he has to Moses. In other words, what God is telling Moses is, I chose you, and in choosing you, I've revealed myself to you in a way that no one else has ever had me revealed to them. They knew me as God Almighty, yes. They knew my other name, I am who I am. But they just knew me as El Shaddai, God Almighty. You know me as both, God Almighty. And I am who I am. And I've promised to bring the people of Israel into a land that previously they lived in as sojourners. They were travelers through it. And I remember my covenant. I remember my promise. So he's reminding Moses here of something very significant. That not only Moses, do you have a deeper understanding of just who I am. I have not forgotten my covenant in the midst of that. You know, we may question a lot of things, especially when circumstances go from bad to worse, as is the case here. Especially when we're doing exactly what we believe God has truly called us to do. When we believe that we're in the center of God's will, obedient, serving, doing everything we can. And things go off the rails. When that happens, perhaps we need to be reminded, just as Moses was reminded by God, God is always in control. God remembers his promises. He hasn't forgotten about us when things go wrong. So that's what God reminds Moses. But then he says, now here's what I want you to tell the people. Verses 6 through 8. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. 
God knows the position that Moses is in. He is fully aware of the growing unrest amongst the people of Israel. He knows that they blame Moses for their current predicament. That Moses is now questioning God's call. God knows that. And even God's intention. God understands that. So the Lord tells Moses exactly what he needs to say to the people of Israel. He's already told Moses what Moses needs to hear. Moses, I haven't forgotten. Remember who I am. Remember how I've revealed myself to you in a way different than I ever revealed myself fully to Abraham or to Isaac or to Jacob. He says, you need to remind the people of Israel of some things. First, they need to remember who I am. I am the Lord. He says it twice, both at verse uh, 6, at the beginning of verse 6, and at the end of verse 8. I am the Lord. I am who I am has heard you. Their God has heard them. Second, they need to be reminded that it is he that will bring them out of Egypt. It's not Moses and Aaron. They're the, the mouthpieces, the instruments, yes, but it is God's mighty hand that will act. It could have been somebody other than Moses, somebody other than Aaron. God was still going to act. In other words, stop blaming God or stop blaming Moses for how God is handling their situation. Third, God fully intends to make Israel his own special people. And the word in there that, that I think I love most of all in that is found in verse 6. I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you. Redemption not only speaks of purchasing their freedom, but it's purchasing their freedom while acting as a kinsman. He's saying, my relationship with you is, is deeper than just you are my people and I'm your God. I'm acting as your kinsman here. A familial relationship, a father to his children. Fourth, the people of Israel need to be reminded that God fully intends to fulfill his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He had promised them a home in Canaan, a land where they had lived as sojourners, as travelers. He's going to bring them into the land he has promised to give to them. He's going to keep his promise. So stop being worried about the how and start focusing on the who. One other particular thing that we ought to notice about verses 6 through 8. I don't know if you caught it when I read it. Let me, let me read it to you again. I'll emphasize for effect here what I want us to pick on. Say therefore to the people of Israel, verse 6, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Seven times God says, I will. This is the answer we need to focus upon. Not what we think we are trying to do. Let's focus on what God says he will do. When God says, I will, we can take that to the bank. There's nothing left on the table here at this point. God has said it. He said, I will. And believe me, and, and we can talk uh, about the different forms of God's will. There's God's permissive will. In other words, what he allows to happen. But there's also God's sovereign will. And here I don't think we're seeing God's permissive will. 
we're seeing God's sovereign will. God is saying, this is going to happen. I am who I am says, this is what's going to happen. It's bookended on both sides by, I am the Lord. I am who I am says this. This is what I am going to do. There's a lot of times when, you know, I've said in my own life, well, this is what I am going to do. And I'll do my best to do it. But I can fail at those things. But when God says, I will, there's no failure. There's no turning back. There's no, well, it might not happen. There's no, eh, maybe, maybe not. And so on this day before Thanksgiving, let me remind you that if God has said, I will about something, we can bank on it. And for Central Church, let me just remind you, I know we're going through some difficult days right now. But Jesus said, I will build my church. He said that to Peter, and it was not upon Peter personally that that was resting, but rather upon the fact that when people put their faith in Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus Christ is built. And he said, I will do it. I will redeem those who are lost in sin. I will make them into new creatures. God will do it, regardless of what we do. Be thankful in that, that God's promises are sure. And even when things appear to be going completely off the rails, we can be thankful and trust in I am who I am to fulfill his promises. I hope tomorrow you have a great Thanksgiving. Father, we thank you. And Lord, in our own lives, the well, life of our church right now, it looks like things are going off the rails, but Lord, you are in control. You have promised that you will build your church. So Lord, help us to take a deep breath, help us to relax, help us to be thankful and joyful in the midst of what appears to us to be a train wreck. And help us, Father, to be confident in your promises and the fact that you are in control. Help us to take steps of faith. Where our faith wavers, strengthen it, Lord. Where our faith is strong, Lord, strengthen it. We give you the thanks and the honor and the glory today in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Hope to see you next week.